Um, hold on just a second. I'm gonna switch screens here and share mine. Um, continue sharing your location. We get an idea of where everybody's from. And I mentioned earlier that um, I'm in place of Bill Shepard this morning because he had knee replacement surgery yesterday and is home recuperating. So I'll be leading this, but Larry's really gonna be the one that's giving the, the leading us in his presentation. Um, I'm just gonna to touch on a few things because we do have a few new people joining us today and welcome everybody. Um, the CO Executives in Transition is a new initiative we started in September, 2020 with the help of a lot of our directors. Um, we established this to really help our members and any CEO globally to get back to work. So we're providing our weekly sessions. We have our online platform as well, and we record everything. So if you're new and coming in, um, everything's been recorded and you can go back and look through the entire archives to, um, to see what we've done and to get some support there. Um, and what we're doing really aligns with what we do at the CO Forum and supporting chief operating officers and second in command executives. And as I mentioned, we're in our third quarter and um, I'm gonna put it out there. If there's any topics that we have not hit in the last nine, so, nine or so months that you'd like to hear, um, any speakers that you'd like to see brought back, anything that you think would improve this and help you um, to get to your next best job, please send an email to me, put it in the chat. I'll get a copy of the chat and I can take a look at that. And I also asked the question, the Mighty Networks, if um, you can submit it in there as well, because we wanna make this program the best for you in the next six months here going forward. Um, just meeting rules, Bill goes over those, these each week. I think the main thing, muting is not as big a deal today because it's gonna be an interactive session with Larry and, um, if, if you hear it, if there's any feedback or any noise, just mute yourself or I might go in and mute you just as a temporary so we can hear things better. Um, business first, if you have to run in or out, no big deal. Um, and if you have to leave early, that's not a problem. We do record it so you can come back and see it. Um, business language, because it works best. Um, we are recording, as I mentioned. Um, keep your job prospects confidential. And I think Larry's gonna run the Q&A a little differently. Feel free to put any questions in there and we'll, we'll get to them. Um, throughout the entire meeting. Fiona is your go-to. If you need anything after this or even during this, just chat her. Um, she's available after and she supports everybody in this effort. And I am going to introduce Larry. Um, uh, let me stop sharing real quick so we can see everybody that's here. And um, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about Larry. Larry's in Boston. Um, he is a licensed Harvard trained doctoral level psychologist, entrepreneur, author, and entrepreneur in residence for a private equity firm. He's vice president of boardoptions.com. Nominating and governance committees of boards, boards of directors retain boardoptions.com for a talented board and an educated board. Uh, the core services include board self-evaluation, board retained search, and board education. He's also founder of Stival Peabody Associates, founded in 1979. Its mission is leadership and career success for executives whose roles touch the board of directors. He's listed in Marquee Who's Who in Business and Who's Who in America. In 2019, Marquee Publishing presented Larry with the Marquee Lifetime Achievement Award for his enduring contributions and leadership to leadership. The readers of Massachusetts Lawyers Weekly named Stibel Peabody Associates Best Outplacement Firm for 2020. He's been on the board of venture-backed tech company in the HR tech space and a member of the board of directors of the New England chapter of the National Association of Corporate Directors. And for the past seven years, I've had the privilege of working with Larry as he has led the New England chapter of the CO Forum. And I'm very happy today to welcome Larry and um, he will share his topic on how to tell a story that'll make your candidacy stand out. Larry, it's yours. Thank, thank you very much, Laura. Um, this is gonna be an interactive program and actually my part is gonna be relatively small and yours is gonna be relatively big. So if you have something to write something down that would be great because uh, you're going to need it, uh, whether it's a pad or a paper, but be prepared to write something something down. The, the topic is uh, how to be a mitten finder, and I'll explain what that means a little later. My goal is explain why um, we are so overwhelmed with information. Um, and one of the ways to cut through the overwhelming nature of information are simple, powerful stories I call mitten stories. 
And I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell you three mitten stories. And then you will create your own mitten stories and we will share. My first story is uh, about Apple computer and the iPod. The story of the iPod was that the technology behind the MP3 player was pretty old and established. It was established in 1981 by RCA. However, by 1999, the MP3 player was already well established within the industry. Sony was prob probably the most popular MP3 player around. Then Dell and Microsoft each had their own players. When the companies competed with each other, the MP3 player market, they competed against, here's how many gigabytes of data you can get for how many dollars and why ours is better. In 2001, uh, Apple comes out and with its iPod. Now, again, it's 2001, this technology has already been on the market. Sony is already leading the pack and it's very late in the game. Here's what Steve Jobs does. He has a conference and he walks out with his trademark black turtleneck and blue jeans. And he has an iPod in his pocket. And the camera zooms in on Steve Jobs' hands as he goes into his pocket, retrieves his iPad, looks into the camera and says, a thousand songs in your pocket. That's it. The image of Steve Jobs just sticking his hand in his trousers, coming up with this iPod and saying, a thousand songs in your pocket became the watchword for how iPod overtook the MP3 market. The point I'm trying to make is that Steve Jobs understood in a world of too much information, simple is powerful. Now, I'll tell you my mitten story. When I'm asked to talk about Stiebel Peabody outplacement, I usually manage to get the conversation uh, to uh, say, let me tell you how I stopped a law firm partner from jumping off Mount Washington. For those of you on the West Coast, Mount Washington is the highest peak on the East Coast. The story is as follows. There was a law firm partner who uh, went to Harvard undergraduate, Harvard Law, and then joined one of the big, th the largest three law firms in Boston. He was, was called a service partner in estate planning and probate. Now, service partner means you don't necessarily have your own clients, but you serve the clients of other partners who sold their business. So he was a service partner. The firm then decides there's no such thing as a service partner. You either have your own business or you're dead. And so they gently forced him out of the firm. They provided us, they provided him with Stiebel Peabody Executive Outplacement Services. He wanted to go and join another firm as a partner. The problem was that if he has no business to bring in, if he has no clients of his own, what firm wants him? And that's exactly what was going on. No firm would have him. I would often say, what about starting your own firm? I'll work with you and, and get you started. He would say, I would rather die. Okay. So he kept trying. He kept failing. One day he's talking with me and he says, you know, I think what I will do is drive my car up Mount Washington turn around when I get to the top. And then as I go down, I will just smash the car, take the car off Mount Washington. And at least my wife and my son will have the insurance to live on. I'm now in a bind. Um, as Laura said, I'm a licensed doctoral level psychologist. I have an ethical and a regulatory requirement that if a client of mine says that they're going to hurt themselves or hurt somebody else, then confidentiality is off the table. I should recommend that he 
commit himself into an institution. And if he doesn't want to do that, I can forcibly have him committed into a psychiatric institution. Do I handle this as a psychologist or do I handle this as a businessman? I decide to to take a chance and handle it as a businessman. I say to him, you know, you're assuming that when you drive your car off Mount Washington, you will die. But here's a possibility. You drive your car off Mount Washington and you live. You're just a quadriplegic. So now your wife and son, not only are not getting your insurance money, now they have to take care of a quadriplegic. How about this? Let me work with you uh, on helping you set up your own practice for three years. And then if it doesn't work, then you could drive your car off Mount Washington. And he smiles. He says, well, I'm very conservative. I guess that's the most conservative thing I could do. I said, that's right. So that's what happened. I worked with him to set up his own uh, consulting practice. I used some of our psychology tools to help him find a very focused niche. And he was successful in doing that. Five years later, I get a call from him saying, Larry, I just got a call from a mid-sized Boston law firm asking me if I would join them as a lateral partner. What do you think? I said, it doesn't matter what I think. The important thing is, what do you think? He says, why would I want to give up my own practice just to join a law firm? At that point, I knew I had been successful in my intervention. Now, let's analyze that story. What am I saying without saying it? Um, I'm saying that I do outplacement, but I do it at very senior levels. I'm working with a partner at a law firm. I'm, I'm saying that I'm both a psychologist and a business professional and bring that to the perspective. The third thing I'm implying but not stating is that I know how to help somebody be successful in starting their own professional service practice. That's all conveyed in that simple little story. Now, what are the elements of a good story? The first is a catchy title. Uh, Steve Jobs had a catchy title, a thousand songs in your pocket. I had a catchy title how I stopped a law firm partner from jumping off Mount Washington. My story has a source of tension and conflict. Do I deal with this as a psychologist or do do I deal with this as a businessman? And of course, it has a happy ending. Those are the three elements of a good story, a catchy title, some sort of tension, and a happy ending. Now let's go to the mitten finder. Here's the story. My client is a chief operating officer and is interviewing for a position. When asked, uh, well, tell me about yourself, he said, I'm a mitten finder, to which naturally they said, what's a mitten finder? He says, well, let me tell you the story. Our industry was having its annual uh, trade show and in Las Vegas, And I was asked to be on a panel discussing technology trends that I see in our industry over the next five years. My CEO attended the trade show. I came up to her after my talk. I asked her what she she thought. And she said, it's fine, except it's cold today. And I took my mittens. I went to the uh, trade show exhibit hall and I can't find my mittens. I called the hotel staff and they can't find the mittens. So I said, let me try. So I went to the trade show exhibition hall and I assumed that she was looking on the floor for the mittens, but I figured I should look on the floor and on the tables. And I walked up and down the aisles and sure enough, the mitten was there on one of the tables. I am the mitten finder. Now, what does that story say without saying it? It says, 
I am the kind of person that our industry goes to when they want to understand what are the technology trends in the future. I have a national reputation for doing that. However, if you need something mundane, detailed, and follow up, I'm good at that. I find lost mittens. Again, elements of a good story. The first is a catchy title. I am a mitten finder. Two, some sort of tension and conflict. My CEO comes to my presentation and loses her mittens. What am I going to do about it? And finally, it has a happy ending. Now I've spoken too much. It's your turn. What I want you to do is I want you to take a piece of paper or anything you're writing on, and I want you to write your own mitten story, and then we'll share it with each other. Remember, here are the elements of a good mitten story. One, a catchy title. Two, sometime in the story, there's going to be tension. And three, a happy ending. So I want, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to give you about five minutes to write your own story. And then let's have a discussion and share stories. Just so I can get a sense, when you have finished your mitten story, would you raise your hand so I'll know who's, who's, who's done? Is anyone done? Raise your hands. Okay. I'll give you another two minutes, and then I'm going to ask Paul to uh, tell us his mitten story. Then I'll ask Peter. Okay, I hope you've got the gist of your stories, even if you don't have it completely written down. Paul, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where do you, where do you, where do you live, and what are you looking for? Am I the only Paul? Uh, you're the only Paul, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Paul Klotz. I live in I live outside of Dallas, Texas. Where where in Dallas? I I lived in Dallas. I live in a little town called Copper Canyon. Wow. Now, yeah, I never heard of that. Wow. That's that is... 35 miles north 
north northwest of Dallas. Okay. So my story, my mitten story is how to tell a rock star he stinks. Oh, good. Okay, that great title. Okay. So um, I was second in command of an advanced technology solutions provider in the Dallas area. And we were, um, we were, I would say, best in class at what we did, providing large technology infrastructure solutions to midsize and large corporations. And our very top salesperson, who was also my friend Stephanie, came to me one day and hmm. said, hey, I got a problem. Um, Anil, who our top pre-sales engineer in the company um, and also from another country um, stinks so bad that we can't uh, when we go into a conference room to have a meeting with the client people can't handle it and um, and we can't last more than 10 minutes in a meeting without having to have an air break where we all get out and breathe and she said I don't know what to do I love him to death he's got four different CCIE certifications and he is absolutely the best, but we can't have a meeting with him in it because he stinks so bad. <clears throat> and I knew Anil a little bit at the time. Um, and so I said, oh, let me talk to him. And um, so I brought Anil into my office and you could tell he was scared. He thought something, cause I was the CEO of the company and uh, he didn't report directly up through my chain of command and why would I want to talk to him? And um, I sat him down and I said, Anil, you know, we, we have a very diverse workforce here and I got to tell you something, in this country, most people want to smell like products. They don't want to smell like people. They want to smell like products. They want to smell like aftershave. They want to smell like perfume. They want to smell like shampoo. They want to smell like body lotion or creams, but they don't want to smell like people. And that's just the way it is in this country. People want to smell like products. And I've heard, I've heard from various people that you smell like people and you don't smell like products and they really want you to smell like products. <laughs> and he said, oh my God, I thought you were going to fire me for something I did. And I said, no, it's just simple. You got to come in tomorrow smelling like products. And from that day on, he came in just squeaky clean, smelling like products. And that was more than 10 years ago. And we're still friends today. In fact, I talked to him yesterday. Okay. That's um, my story. Lovely. All right. Let's have any comments. Uh, Keith, do you have any comments on that story? Well, I, I, I liked it. Uh, I think it was a good story. I'm not sure what message it <laughs> what the business message was exactly. ah okay so let, let what's what's what is the what's the business message that's a very good point what is the business message so for me there are a lot of different business messages in there one is that i was coo of a company and i had an open door policy so a salesperson who's not in my chain of command can come to me and ask me to solve a problem so i'm i'm open to solving all kinds of problems and then I can speak to somebody else who's also not in my chain of command. There's my open door policy again. And so I can solve problems that, you know, I don't have, it's not my job in my job description. So I'll solve whatever problem needs to be solved. And then I can take a, a dicey situation with people and handle it in a way that, mm. that, uh, that nobody really gets hurt or upset. And it's, if you've ever, if you have never had to have a conversation like that, and that's the only one I've ever had, it was a really difficult thing to do in a business environment. And so it shows that I'm capable of doing that. I'm capable of having a, a difficult conversation like that in a way that has a positive outcome. I, I agree with you. I, let me make a slight modification to your mitten story. And that is in the middle, there's, you want, to, you want to be clear about what the conflict is. And, the, and to me, lis, listening mm -hmm. to your story, the conflict is as follows. If I say nothing to this gentleman, I'm not doing the right thing for the company because somebody brought it to my attention. 
If on the other hand, I make it too personal, I'm going to risk offending him and insulting him mm -hmm. and he'll quit or be, he will lack motivation. So how do I do the right thing for the company without offending this individual? And the way I did it was not make it about you smell, you smell bad. I made it about, this is something you need to understand about Americans. Americans want to smell like product and you smell like a person. Um, I just think you, you basically imply that without stating it, I'd be much more explicit about it. Okay. Peter. Hey, Larry. Tell us your story. Morning. Great, thank you. Um, so I would say that I am the secret service of finance and operations for a company. Okay. And what I mean by that is I protect the business. I look out for trouble around corners and I keep the CEO safe. In other words, I'm the guy who's gonna get in between him and the trouble and uh, take the bullet if necessary. <laughs> so um, in this case, we had a major, I was at a uh, outsourced IT um, consulting business. We had a major client who informed me they were canceling our service. And as I say, it was one of the largest clients that we had at the time. So got off the phone, grabbed the CEO by the arm, said, come with me, we're going to sit down with this client right now. And uh, we didn't have an appointment. We just walked a block up the street, got into his office and listened. And you know, wanted to find out, you know, this was a longstanding client, kind of out of the blue, why was he all of a sudden deciding he wanted to um, stop using our service. Well, it turns out he genuinely just wanted to see if we cared about this piece of business for his, um, that they were sending to us. And, um, you know, as I said, we listened and at the end of it, it was almost that he wanted to know that we appreciated his business and we cared about it. And in fact, we communicated that to them and uh, resulted in a renegotiation with an upsell. So um, what could have been a crisis <clears throat> moment and a serious erosion of a, a good piece of business turned into an improvement in the relationship and uh, in fact, you know, increased relationship with the client. Okay, good. Okay, uh, Kay or Kai Chung, what would, any comments on the story, Kai? Kai, can you hear us? All right, uh, Glennis, any comments on the story, Glennis? Um, thought it was a nice story per se, but I don't know if it fit all the elements that are required. All right, tell, tell, me, tell me more. Um, uh, the title didn't really be in, it was more just a descriptor versus, um, an element. And I wasn't quite sure what the tension conflict, you know, uh, was in mm -hmm. from that title that was being solved. I, I, I agree with you, Glennis, uh, the, the title, I'm the secret service. D d it, the story doesn't follow from that from that area. Um, uh, so I think I think the title needs some work. The I also agree with Glennis. What is the tension that you know you could say? Um, I know how to pick the right tools for the right circumstances. And here was the situation. Uh, uh, our best client told me that they're thinking about um, stopping our business. What am I going to do about it? Is this something that I should do? Is it something I should write a memo to the VP of sales? No, I just I just grabbed the CEO and I said, "Come on, we're going to talk. To, we're going to go up the street and talk to this guy right now," and that was the right thing to do. 
uh, it's more about selecting the best, the most appropriate solution to a problem at hand to me. Um, but thank you, thank you for your comments, Glynis. Um, Peter, any, any, any thoughts, reactions to the comments? I appreciate the feedback. Um, uh, as I said, you know, the, I guess the tension conflict was, uh, as I mentioned, uh, not wanting to, uh, you know, let the ball drop or, you know, just accept that, uh, you know, we're going to have this uh, major erosion in the, uh, revenue stream and, uh, uh, you know, in order to protect the business and protect the uh, CEO, you know, I thought immediate action was necessary and, uh, you know, that was resulted in the happy ending part of it. So I guess. I think that there's some, you know, there's something you're, you're glossing over. Mm -hmm. Why did this best client say this to you as opposed to the account representative or the vice president of sales or the CEO himself? Um, it's a good question. You know, it was a, a small growing business. So I guess I'm trying to think if- I mean, you're the, you're the CFO. You're the CFO, COO, yeah. Okay, why? Yeah. Uh, and I'm trying to think if it was because the account was coming up for an anniversary renewal and again it was several years ago i forget what initiated it but as i said it ended up on my desk and uh um so yeah it was either the renegotiation or an anniversary but you know there was a uh there was some in you know, milestone that uh, I think he wasn't just going to auto renew and something like that. Okay, so he, so he told you he was not going to auto renew. So that would, would explain why it was on your desk. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I think I, I agree with Glennis that kind of the, the, key, the key issue here is instincts. Mm -hmm. I have, I, you know, I, I have good instincts for when things need to be done an emergency way versus a slower way. Mm -hmm. uh, Jackie, can you uh, tell us your case? Jackie, Jackie Farner. Jackie, you there? No. All right, how about Russ Singleton? Uh, can you unmute yourself, Russ? Yep. There I go. Sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> tell us your story, Russ. So my story is about... Um, get, uh, the title first. Okay. I uncomplicate chaos. Uncomplicate uh, what? Chaos. Okay. Uncomplicate chaos. I have been, just as a background, I've been in a lot of turnaround situations. I am used to jumping into new situations <laughs> and figuring, working with teams. Um, a few years ago, I was in a situation where I was working with a surgical uh, medical device company uh, that was trying to get to CE Mark, which is the clearance in Europe, and they were struggling with it over three years. And I was brought in as an outsider to the team. Um, and I remember meeting with the team. Um, we met in a small conference room and it was uh, over many, they were the leadership team for the organization of what was going on. And one of the things we talked about was we have too much to do. They said, we have all these things to do and we can't do it. And we're trying to get it done in a small amount of time. And so I said to the team, okay, let's list out everything that we have. Let's uh, put it on a list, put it on a whiteboard or put it in an Excel sheet. And they came up with a list of a thousand items that they needed to get done. And they said, this is great. You guys did a great job. Um, let's now figure out, uh, prioritize them into buckets. So I asked the team to go through and bucket them into 10 categories from one to 10 in priority order of the things that they needed to do. 
And so we did that. And then um, we looked at the first bucket and I said, okay, let's just look at number one bucket and see what we need to do. So the team, I said, now we need to go through this bucket and prioritize from A to Z add on. And um, we're gonna work on those things. So there's, you know, this happened over several days. So this wasn't just in a single meeting. And um, they went through it and they did the A item, the B item, the C item. When they got up to G, I said, we're done. Stop. That's all we're going to do. And they said, oh, no, no, you can't do that. And I said, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on those top 10 things. And we're going to do them one at a time. We're going to form teams around them and focus on them. So I structured, I worked with the team to focus on the top 10 things. And we literally went through maybe about 10 or 15 things and got to the objective of being able to submit to European authorities with the product and get through CE mark. So that was, it was a successful outcome out of this whole thing. But it was something that the team needed someone from the outside to come in and help them figure out what they needed to do. They couldn't do it themselves. So okay. that's what Good. I did. Uh, let me try Kai, Kai Chung again. Are you available? Kai? K or K E I? Hey, it's K. K. K, are you around? No, let's just move to Kurt Kaufman. Kurt, do you have any comments on, on the story? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I, I um, didn't love the title. No offense. <laughs> Right. No, no, look, that's, that's what that's what we're here for. But yeah. but what I <laughs> what I heard and what is most important is something that I think many of us probably deal with in our lines of business is if you have twenty, if you have thirty priorities, there's too many. Focus on you know these few items to get the task done. So uh, that came through loud and clear on your on your story. Okay. You can't, I, have, you can't have a thousand issues, right? Or you're never going to get the, the application submitted. Right. So um, that, that's what I picked up on. I, I, I agree with, with, with Kurt. Even, even, and even stronger, I would say, if, uh, if a CEO is interviewing five COO finalists, how many of those COO finalists would say, I create order out of chaos or something to that effect. Um, that is, it's kind of like what the job's about and people who are good as COO do that. That's kind of what they do. So I think your, your title is not going to be dramatically rememberable. Um, I think most of your competitors will say something similar. So I would work on the title. In one of the, um, one thing that could be a title would be how, how I worked with a company that's pursuing excellence to, to be satisfied with good enough. And the idea is in, in order to get the thing done, which, which is the CE certification, um, was it good enough for that? That's another thing that I, I didn't see missing. You set up the, 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 the drama of the company is in the med, medical device business and needs the CE certification. It's not getting it. The last thing I want to hear in your story is, and we got the CE certification. Kurt, any any thoughts? Uh, I, I I agree, Larry. Um, the I guess the actual the, the outcome, or you know, the 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 happy ending. Did did they get the certification? Yes, they did. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's got to be la that's got to be the last thing you say. You, you got the result. Yeah, how how I got a company to get their European certification 
by uh, giving up the pursuit of excellence and focusing on the pursuit of good enough. That I think people could relate to. And again, the pursuit of good enough might be something to, to think about. Okay. I, I might um, also add at the end, like not everybody knows what the CE certification is. So I might put at the end and that enabled them to go to market within three months It enabled them to get acquired some result of that of the yeah. certification because it's like the you know a 510k you get it approved but it, it's good but it doesn't buy you anything in itself so what was the real goal at the end of that and i think that could be the sort of the cherry on top of the story of okay. what, what happened at the end okay. just to add just for your information within it was about three months that we got through the first uh was able to place it out in the field and we got four placements in europe and yeah see, that. that that is a that's a big success story that you that you launched the product it, you know in europe in my opinion that would be a um... all right so uh let me ask for volunteers now can can someone uh, this uh, is julio i volunteer right. fine julio so where, sure. do you, where do you where do you live julio uh, i live in minneapolis and my story centers around building long-term personal and business relationships for success. I uh, once saved my boss's life on a business trip in China in 2006. So I had a, a new, uh, and at the time I was head of all strategic accounts for a large company. We had a new CEO, we had a new head of sales, and they decided to go on a global trip with uh, seven stops around the world in the corporate jet. And we all packed in this jet and had all these meetings. And on the third stop, in Macau, in China, my uh, my direct boss, the head of global sales, uh, fell ill, and the meeting lasted two or three days. He wouldn't leave his room. He wouldn't want to go see a doctor. And the jet was fueled and ready to take off to the next step. And I decided to stay behind with him. And I didn't know him very well. I had just met him, and uh, so what ended up happening is he was very, very ill. So I had a customer uh, in China that I was very close with. He was in Hong Kong. He came across to Macau. He brought uh, you know, somebody to help me take him to a doctor. I didn't speak any Chinese. If you have been to Macau, you know, there's uh, not your typical uh, sort of hospital environment. And I ended up um, you know, staying back with him, taken him to the hospital. He got better uh, after three days in the hospital. We ended up meeting the rest of the, or the corporate crew uh, towards the end. And um, I would say that the story there for me and the happy ending is that I built a great relationship with the guy who ended up being my, my boss for a number of years, I still stay in touch with him. And more importantly, a customer saw more of a, you know, a personal side of me and, and what I did. Uh, so I, you know, I'm, I'm able to manage those relationships. You know, I could have easily just you know, followed the, follow the crowd. I decided not to do that. I can think for myself and, and do what I consider the right thing. And uh, so that's my, my meaningful message in the story. Okay. Uh... Lara, can you comment on that and give give him give Julio some feedback? Lara, L A R A. No, I'm not hearing anything there. How about Catherine King? King? Catherine, can you comment on that? No, I'm not hearing anything there either. Um, how about uh, Peter? Peter Rocket. Um, a very good story. You know, it showed uh, that, uh, again, you took that uh, personal initiative to, um, you know, stay behind, help the person in a crisis moment. And uh, like you said, the easy thing would have been uh, to jump on the plane with everybody else. And, uh, um, but, uh, you know, that, that's my sort of reaction to it. Uh, I, I agree. If if anything, I'm, I might be inclined in the story to really the, the, the section about where is the conflict and where is the drama? I think you 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 went too light on. And if I was telling the story, I'm, I might say, you know, here's this guy and he's telling everybody to go away. He can take care of itself and He'll, he'll figure it out in his hotel room. He doesn't need anyone. And everyone 
agrees to go away and do what he suggests except you yeah. and you you Thanks. did not follow his instructions you did not follow what he asked you to do you saw he needed more help than he was willing to, to state and you were right yeah and, uh, there, and in terms of the drama larry there was one little tidbit that i i went ashore in this story but at the time there was avian flu in 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 china so we had to go back to the mainland and we had a helicopter at our disposal to do that. But I felt that was too risky because he had an elevated temperature and we would have probably gotten sent back. So we ended up taking like a very low cost ferry to get across with a lot of people around us just so we can get across and I can take him to the hospital. So there was a, even that drama of choosing, you know, a different way to do it. Uh, uh, again, trying to keep the story short, I think is where, where I probably struggle with, you know, to try to drive my message across and not make it so prolonged that I, I lose the interest uh, of the audience. Julio, remind us, what was the title of your story? Uh, the title of the story was, I, I build meaning for long-term personal and business relationships for success. I once saved my boss's life on a business trip in China. I think just I saved my boss's life in China is your, the name of your story. Uh, absolutely, I, I I totally agree with Terry. Because uh, again, the idea is you have to imagine uh, your the hiring authority is looking at five candidates for the position, and all five candidates can do the job. So it's really going to come out to a personal decision. And what makes you memorable? What makes you stand out? I say my boss's life will will probably be something that the other four candidates will not say. Um, whereas I know how to make meaningful relationships, and uh, everybody can say that. So Thanks, yeah, I, I I totally I totally I totally agree. Joanne, tell us your story. Okay, um, my story is don't cry over spilt oil. Um, I got a call in April of 2010 and learned that our client uh, BP uh, that we had the cat exposure on ha was spilling oil into the Gulf of Mexico and that there were, um, there were models that were showing that we might have to take in 90,000 claims a day. And at the time, uh, Spike weekend for us was about 2,000 claims with uh, 500 clients. And so we had to ramp quickly. The PR for BP, as you probably all remember, was uh, quite poor. And uh, because they didn't have a solution to solve their problem at the time, which was playing out on TV. And um, my responsibility and oversight at the time was of our call center, our intake center that took claims predominantly for our workers' comp claims. And we had to shift gears and take, uh, I hope this will work. Guys. Don't worry, no. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> the work at home atmosphere. Um, so we had to shift gears, take claims, and we had to, uh, I mean, in real time, solve this problem. And so um, they did not want any international uh, claims handling because of their PR difficulty. And so I worked with our vendor to find capacity in the US and we could not find the volume that we needed. So we went to Canada and um, asked if they would consider North America as, you know, all in the same category. We were successful there and found a facility in Winnipeg where we could spin up 1500 call uh, adjusters in six days. Um, and, you know, the, the end result is that we were able to service the VP claimants in a way we were there first uh, first contact really in the whole situation where we had adjusters out on the beaches handing out checks and um, taking the first notices of loss and really were able at least with the claimants to provide a feeling of security that BP was gonna make good on their promise and pay them for valid claims and we spun into action very quickly. Um, additionally, we did things like uh, we had to get websites and uh, call intake recordings in every language that was predominant, uh, mostly Southeast Asian 
uh, languages for the fishermen, and um, we we handled that uh, very well. <laughs> okay. Uh, let, before we get into the comments, let me just comment on your Zoom presence. You're wearing glasses, and the glasses are reflecting yeah. the uh, the what you're seeing in the screen right back into your glasses. Yeah. I, I don't know about others, but I'm finding it distraction. Uh, I would wish you wouldn't wear glasses or find find some sort of uh, um, glasses that that don't do that. Another thing that might help. You have light that's coming behind you yeah. and creating a halo on the top of your head. Yeah. Maybe if you if you had a light source that's directly in front of you, like if you were if you position the uh, computer in front of a window. Yeah. That so that we, uh, that. <clears throat> for any interviews, I take them in my husband's office for that exact reason. This is sort of my makeshift office, but yes, I'm yeah well aware. It's <laughs> okay. Not fine. great lighting, but thank you. <laughs> So Sima, any, any reaction to the story? I actually remember that time um, very vividly. So I know how hard it must have been um, to go through it, being involved. Um, I, I like the whole, because we all know about the story and what happened is just, um, it was rather long. So I had to keep my focus. Um, on what she was trying to say. And I like the fact that you uh, smiled and you, um, you talked about what you had to do. There was no really um, good PR uh, and you had to learn or they had to learn on real time how to manage the issue. Rod, any any uh, any comments on the story? Rod? Sorry. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, are there two Rods? Um, yeah, Rod, you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I like the story. Um, I I think if if I could offer any advice, one would be um, it's pretty good title. Uh, Don't cry over spilled oil. Um, maybe tie that in like something like um you know how i saved well i don't know if saved is the right word but you know re rescued bp out of an oil spill or something like that that might be maybe a bit too much but think about that a little bit and then um i liked your story you set up the the, the conflict and the interest kind of well but um i would emphasize more the the solution and the results a little bit um so I liked how you, I mean, they were looking for North Americans, if you will, and you found Canadians. So that's like a clever solution finding. Um, but like, it didn't, I didn't feel like it was driven home, like like what the, the result was of that. I, 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 I agree with Rod about the title. Um, you might, my gut instinct, you know, was to say, you know, when it hits the fan, I'm your man. But I said, you know, you know how do I do that? And then, uh, but it's something, you know, something along the, t on the lines of, you know, if it hits the fan, you want me to be next to you. Um, and then, because it's, it's, really it's really not about BP. It's really about your stepping into a, a bloody mess and getting the systems and processes in place to make things happen very, very quickly under, under difficult situations. That's, that's the real story. And again, uh, we want a happy ending. And so what I would be looking for from you I would be some numbers. You know, in a matter of three weeks, we processed X number of claims, uh, starting from a, a, you know, you know, be before the oil spill, we were processing X Y number of claims. You know, three weeks later, we're processing X number of claims, 
to show show a, a number. But um, um, my my thinking is, you know, when it hits the fan, you want me standing. You want me that you want me to standing next to you. Some, okay. Something along those lines. Let's take one more and then, then we'll wrap up. Ron? There, Aaron, your... Aaron, Aaron, Aaron's raised his hand a couple times. Okay. I think Aaron? He's got one. All right. The title is I, I've Made Myself Obsolete. Um, I, I had a company that I came into, a startup, where uh, I was the second in command and the, the staff was quite uh, junior, including the, uh, the, the subordinate managers that I had. And as a result, I had to take on a lot of mechanical duties that um, dealing with uh, expense reporting, budgeting, forecasting, things that kind of kept me in more of the tactical stratosphere versus the strategic stratosphere. And I knew that if we were to grow as a company, I needed to create space for myself to step up strategically. I had one individual in particular uh, a young woman named Katie who was interested in, in learning more. She just didn't, uh, she had started as a customer service agent at this company and that was basically her entire profession, a professional experience. She, she, she'd grown into a, been promoted into a position as a, a manager. And so I started uh, carving out an hour a week uh, specifically with her where I would go over um, basic business financials, teach her about, um, about budgeting, forecasting, help, uh, help explore some of the metrics around our shipping, um, things that she just didn't have any experience with. But what I found is that over time, she was becoming more and more proficient uh, with, with these, ta with, with these uh, tasks so that I could actually al assign her uh, responsibility, at least initial responsibility for some of these tasks. As time went on, she realized that she had a desire to, um, to continue to, to grow, but she felt that her, um, her education would prevent her from doing so. Um, so I encouraged her to apply for uh, executive MBA programs, and uh, I wrote recommendations for her, and she applied to four schools and got into all four of the schools that uh, that she had applied to, um, but at the end, not only did she better herself, uh, but I had somebody who was much more skilled in taking on some of these responsibilities that had kept me from from being more strategically focused, and I was able to move further up the strategic uh, chain, so to speak, for my company. Okay, Chris, any reactions to that story? Um. Well, so I don't, I don't think it entirely ties with your title because you didn't really necessarily make yourself obsolete. Um, and I think I don't come away with a real sense of what your strengths are in terms of, you know, you were able to help and mentor uh, one of your employees. That's obviously a, a great story. But in terms of what your story tells, in terms of what you might bring to an organization, I found um, I couldn't quite follow that, that train of thought. I think you know it's, it's a it's a nice story, but it's actually more about Katie than you at the end of the day. Any other any other any other comments, Josh? What do you think? Yeah, I was going to go similar to Chris. I, where was the conflict in the story? That I, I, I missed the. There, it didn't feel like conflict was was enough. It sounded more like, how can I not do this work that I don't want to do? That's the message I got out of it. Yeah, I, th I think I I think I think it. I I agree. I think it ne it needs more work. You want to, This is selling yourself to a potential employer. The story really focuses on your ability to find talent in your in your staff and develop that one talent in the staff. But in the context of a job interview, it, it that may not be. It may not be enough of a story to, to, to differentiate you. I, I, Chris, I'd like to st finish with you. Can you tell us your story? I'll be happy to tell you my story. Yes. My title is I'm an opera singer. Uh, and uh, my story starts in 2006. I was working a large global brand consultancy. Uh, Gillette was one of our biggest clients. We were doing about $8 million of annual revenue with Gillette. 
uh, P&G acquired Gillette in 2006. So in 2007, P&G comes to us for our first interview with P&G. We've never worked with P&G before, uh, and this is the first time we're having our annual review. It was not a great review. It was a poor review. Uh, they did not feel that we were proactive partners. They felt that we made too many mistakes. They felt that we were very reactive versus proactive. And they said, you're at serious risk of losing this business. You have one year to turn this business around. My response, I was the EVP of design operations. My responsibility was to ensure that not only did we retain clients, but that we grow business with clients. And so I did two different things. First, I focused on the unknowns, the, the things that P&G wasn't gonna see, the technologies, the tools, the processes. We put in a new quality assurance process. We changed out some of the team members. We partnered with some agencies in Singapore and in India to be able to turn around our production artwork in 24 hours. Those are the notes. Those are the things that you don't see. But equally, I, I knew we had to tell a much more riching and engaging story with PNG. Uh, they were still in Boston. And so I said, look, we're going up once a quarter. We're going up and we're going to take them out to lunch. We're going to develop a relationship. We're going to get to know them as people. We're going to develop some trust, some honesty, some consistency. At the same time, I called them up and I said, I've got an employee. She want, she's dedicated to your account. Can you give her a desk? She'll be up there. She'll be in your offices. You don't have to pay her a dime. I'm paying everything, but she's going to be in your offices. A year later, P&G came back. We were all very nervous. We didn't want to lose an $8 million piece of business. We got an excellent review. They were incredibly happy. They felt that we were collaborative, true partners, and they awarded us a new piece of business with Ivory worth an additional $2 million a year. Very nice. Uh, Kamal, what do you think? Comment? Kamal, owner, can you unmute yourself? I, I have to run. I was just write, writing um, a note. I have to run. I'm sorry. Okay. Right. Uh, Seema, what do you think? I um, very much like the ending and how Chris and his team were able to get not only to keep the PNG for $8 million, but get another two. Um, I guess I wouldn't go too much into detail that you get help from you got help from India or Singapore. Um, I don't think there is a need to include that. Um, as far as the conflicts, yes, there was because you were going to lose the customer, but it happens to all of us at CEOs. I guess that we would lose customer or members. So I don't know if that was. I mean, Larry, you could say about that, but the title of it, the opera singer, I don't know, I guess, what you were trying to, um, to articulate in a way. I definitely liked from the middle to the end of it, um, but I might add a little bit different things at the beginning. Hi, about you? I don't know. I'm not the expert in that, but um, that's how I felt. Larry, can I say I agree that I didn't get the correlation of the opera singing weaving into the story. So I love the, you know, the conflict and the resolution and the happy ending, but I, you know, kept waiting for the uh, opera uh, tie-in. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, I agree with both of you. Um, I, I, also, I also think embedded in here and unspoken is really that I think a, a better title for your, for your story. And that is um, how we learn to turn on a dime for a, for a client and, uh, um, or how we learn to how we how we how we learn to pivot for a client because one of the things you don't state but it's implied is that your approach your company's approach 
to Gillette suited Gillette so well that you had a long-term relationship with Gillette and were very satisfied. Then, therefore, when P&G, the new owner, tells you, we don't like what you're doing, what they're basically saying was, you may have been fine for the Gillette culture, but you ain't good enough for P&G. And well, everything you're saying is about how you turned around your operations to support the P&G culture. But that's not the story that I'm trying to tell. So maybe I need to tell it, tell it in a different way because the story I'm trying to tell is that an opera singer needs to be able to sing the notes and needs to know tempo and volume and languages. But an opera singer also needs to connect to an audience and tell a story and engage with the audience and create a really rich experience. So as a, as a COO, I need to be able to be put in process and tools and technologies and the things that you don't see. But what I also bring to the table is the ability to create relationships, to understand the importance of building strong bonds with people as part of the success, uh, successful approach of a, of a COO. Uh, so I, I, I appreciate the feedback. I think maybe I just need to, uh, to change the story slightly just to highlight that what an opera singer does is not just technology and tools and process, but they connect to an audience. Hey, Chris, how about you cleaned up your act with ivory? <laughs> That's funny too. Yeah. I like that. I, 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 please do consider what Peter just said. You cleaned up your act with ivory. You know how to clean up your act with ivory. Yeah. Because that will be stick in people's minds. Or got clean with ivory or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Good. Yeah, or, like or tied or, or whatever you whatever you want to <laughs> whatever you want to do. Uh, my, here's here's my concern with opera. You may find, uh, first of all, the story, as you said, only mentions once something to do with notes. Yeah, it doesn't specifically tie in the connection with the audience. So, so if you're going to use the opera thing, you you need to do that. Yeah, more in the setup. Yep. Secondly, the I'm sure that if there are four other candidates that are be interviewing with decision makers, none of them will say I'm I'm an opera singer. So that it'll really differentiate you fine. I think where you, what's missing is what impact does the word opera have for the decision maker? And the answer is you don't know. Now for you, opera may have positive connotations. You may be an opera fan, God love you, that's great. On the other hand, it could be that the person listening to the story has a negative connotations about opera. I've never seen an opera, you know, I go to rock concerts, uh, operas are, are, are for stuffy, stuff shirt kinds of people. And so you, you've tied your, persona to something that somebody might consider negative. What I like about Peter's comment is tying your persona to ivory soap has no downside risks for you, except if you're a Pakistani who doesn't take baths. <laughs> but but for, for, for most, you know, this, we've now gone 360 degrees on, on, on this conversation because it is true. Most Americans want to smell like product. And what is the product they want to smell like? Ivory soap. So yeah. it's it's one of those things. Using ivory as the framework has no downside risks for you. Using opera as the framework could have downside risks and you'll never know because the decision maker will never say, I've never seen an opera. I never want to see an opera. And I think operas are for pansies. They'll never tell you that. So I, I would stick with something a little more conservative and less risky. Peter's idea about how we got clean with ivory would make, would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing, and I, I was stressing this, but I don't think you, you were in charge of this company's um, relationship with Gillette. And I assume it was working until 
Gillette was acquired by P&G. So it's not like suddenly your, your company is a failure. Your, your company was actually doing things that, that Gillette wanted you to do. But now those things are not working with, with P&G and you had to make adjustments quickly and you did. That's really the story. Let me let me sort of conclude here, and then we can. Um, um, what what we've been saying is um, the elements of a good story would be a, a a catchy title, and you you want to you want to use you know what you've done today. You've used your peers as sounding boards to make sure you've got the title. Also, tension and conflict. Some of the comments you got are the, the tension, the conflict wasn't crisp enough. And then finally, the happy ending. The, I, the whole idea is um, you're competing for attention to busy decision makers who are overwhelmed with information. And many of your competitors in the job interviews are saying very similar stories to what you're saying. One of you talked about, I uncomplicate chaos. I don't know a COO who would not say that about themselves in some fashion or some way. A good mitten story can help differentiate you. Uh, and again, if it's done well, it sets a dramatic uh, uh, way to separate yourself from your competitors. The story about how uh, I refused to listen to a guy who, um, who wanted us to leave him and thereby saving his life. That's very dramatic. Again, you can use your mitten stories for your cover letters to gain attraction. You can use it in your interviews and so let me, at this point, are there any questions or comments or concerns about anything we've discussed in, in, in this program? Uh, just raise your hands, be glad to talk with you. Yeah, Ron. Quick question. So um, there, there is some people that mentioned dates like 2006 and 2010 in their story. Um, mm -hmm. Would it be better to leave those dates out or have a story that's more recent or doesn't it matter? I think a good mitten story, you know, I don't, when I tell about how I saved a law firm partner from jumping off Mount Washington, I don't tell the date. Mm -hmm. And this, and it could happen anytime. So I, I, I would agree with you. If, if you can avoid mentioning a date, I would. Again, for you, the date may, may simply be a piece of information, but for the listener of your story, the date may sort of trigger, oh, well, that was 2012. That was so long ago, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So I, 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 I would not put dates in if you could. Okay. Any other comments, concerns, questions? Just a comment for you, Larry. I, I've yeah. attended uh, several sessions about storytelling and I just truly appreciate how you've really just simplified other sessions that are so complex. Thank you. Down to three things. These three things are, I think, really just nip it in the bud. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. I agree. Larry, this has been great. Well, let's let's and let's end on that wonderful note because that was very nice, John. And and I agree. Um, Larry, really appreciate you coming and sharing your time with us today and sharing the whole mitten story. I read the paper that you'd sent me and I was really looking forward to seeing it flesh out here. So thank you very much. And um, we're back on next Tuesday, same time, uh, different topic, different person. And I'll, Fiona will make sure you get all that information uh, so you can join us again next week. But again, Larry, thanks so much. Really appreciate My pleasure. it. Thanks everybody for joining. It's good to see